think we're live now. I think we, I believe we're live. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that's great. So thanks everybody for joining our second uh, webinar in our LGBT webinar series. I'm really pleased today to welcome Osman, who is a volunteer from Hijra, which is the Muslim LGBT uh, support group. He will be talking us some, some, and sharing some lived experience, which I make no apology for, but I do want to warn people that some of the language which is referenced could be offensive. This is about what people have really lived and experienced and hearing on a day by day basis. So I make no apology. It's important we hear it, but I do want to make people aware that the content may be offensive to some viewers. So Osman, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. If you'd like to kick off your webinar for us and there will be a chance to ask some questions at the end and there will also be an opportunity at the end to um, review and evaluate the workshop uh, so that we can learn from the uh, experience. That's great. Thank you so much for this opportunity once again to be able to speak about some of our experiences. So to begin with, I'd just like to start by um, talking a little bit about myself. So I am, my name is Osman and I volunteer for an organisation called Hadaya. Sadly, for many LGBTQI plus Muslims like myself who are not out to their family and friends, life can seem very isolating. However, it's always important to remember that you're not alone. Reaching out to organisations like Hadaya can provide that important support. So here at Hadaya, our vision is to ensure that voices of LGBTQI plus Muslims are heard and understood. Our mission is to provide support and welfare for queer Muslims and promote social justice and education around the queer Muslim community so that we can counter discrimination, prejudice and injustice. So talking about my own personal journey, I think it's important that I start here. So I grew up in a predominantly black and Asian uh, Muslim community. I didn't feel comfortable being out. Both my parents are migrants who grew up in a very different time and place with very different values to my own. One of six siblings, four brothers, and both my mum and dad working seven days a week. If we needed any support, we could always rely on our local South Asian black community to help out. However, I did grow up in, in and around a lot of toxic masculinity with four brothers and my dad. Um, it was challenging at times. For cultural and religious reasons, I was always afraid to be my true self, worried that people would figure out my sexuality. So as a coping mechanism, I put on a very macho front. So when I was 16, I got the opportunity to visit family in London. I had heard that there was a gay scene in a community in London and decided that I would be better off going to London, staying in London, and maybe I would meet someone and live my life on my terms. However, unfortunately, instead of finding acceptance, I was racially abused and I had to leave the, the venue that I had frequented. This rejection, especially at the age of 16, uh, made me very angry, especially towards the gay community. And for me, that was a turning point in my life. I got involved with gangs and a lot of crime, uh, a lot of trouble with the police. I hated myself and wanted to push my family and friends away. I struggled with relationships and um, I went on to meet my ex-wife at college and decided to try and conform to society. After two years of marriage, we split up and I fell into a depression. And this is when I ended up going to Mecca Holy Pilgrimage. My family noticed the decline in my mental health and decided to intervene. By going to Mecca was probably something that saved me. I made positive changes after coming back from Mecca in my life. I joined Hadaya and met with people who had lived or had similar lived experiences as me. I now volunteer and help and stop young people going down the same self-harm, self-destructive route that I did, I went down. So why is Hadaya needed? Um, I'm just going to discuss some of the issues that we come across. So like myself, many LGBTQ Muslims are hidden. Um, we don't have that lack of religious support, means that many Muslim people don't feel comfortable talking about their sexuality with faith leaders, and faith leaders in return are not open to discussing LGBT plus issues with congregations for the fear of backlash. Um, in terms of community support, it's not safe to be out in the community. The stigma of family honour or bringing shame to the family and community stops many queer Muslims coming out. For my own reasons, I don't really care what people think about me, but I do worry about people using my sexuality to hurt my family and the community might ostracise them for how I present. 
In terms of family support, so for many queer Muslims, there is this lack of family support. My family think being gay is a lifestyle choice. They think it's something that's from the West, growing up in the West. So Hadaya has become m my adoptive family. That's how I see it. This family that loves, loves us unconditionally and provides us with support and a safe place to be our true selves without the fear of persecution or judgment. So what are the challenges that we face? Racism and Islamophobia in the queer community, homophobia in the Muslim community, and queer Muslims, we find ourselves stuck in the middle of all of this. So firstly, discussing racism and Islamophobia in the queer community. It can be difficult for Muslim LGBTQI plus people to find accessible and safe spaces within the queer community. Queer Muslim people face damaging stereotypes from other members of the queer community. When some of our members have attended queer venues, they've come across barriers as people presume that because they're wearing a headscarf or a hijab that they're in the wrong place. And when you add alcohol to the mix, you find yourself defending your faith and trying to convince people that you can be gay and Muslim. These constant microaggressions is enough to turn anyone away. In 2019, Manchester Pride revealed its move to start using a different flag, one that includes black and brown stripes. This was to ensure people from black and Asian and other ethnic minority backgrounds felt represented and welcomed at their events. But that this change had a mixed reaction. A, a fierce debate reached between people who believe the move is inclusive and those who felt it was unnecessary. However, my opinion is, and my argument is, that how can a gay white man have the same experiences as I do? And now a, a subject that I don't like talking about um, is politics. The political climate has changed and we see more and more LGBTQI plus people supporting right-wing conservative views. Recently, some gay Trump supporters cited Islam and immigration being their main concerns in America. And even closer to home, um, governments in countries in Europe are also weaponizing sexuality against Islam and immigration. Um, this is just a trigger warning. This slide contains some offensive language, but also the content of the language as well. Uh, I just want to say that um, this slide is real experiences of people who have been on certain apps. And these are just a, a few examples of some of the hate that people receive being online. So for many queer Muslims, going to physical uh, queer places is difficult as it is. Um, at the risk of being outed, many resort to online. And to be honest, even queer online spaces have their issues. Here are some examples. I, uh, once again, I apologize for the language used, but I felt it's important to reflect real experiences. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about queer Muslims in Muslim spaces and Islamic spaces and homophobia in the Muslim community. So from, as I mentioned earlier, from my own personal experience, many Muslim people see homosexuality as a Western phenomenon. Family acts as agents of surveillance and extended family as adult authorities. So many queer Muslims find themselves constantly looking over their shoulder. Is it, which means honour, uh, for family can be held higher than that of individuals. And here, some of the work that we do with Hadaya is around on our base violence. And we have, unfortunately, even this year, had to relocate people because of this. There's some studies that have been carried out recently around higher levels of internalized homophobia amongst South Asian queer Muslims. And then the No Outsiders protests. In 2019, a Birmingham primary school decided to introduce inclusive education around gender and relationships. However, this was met with lots of protests. The vast majority of the protesters were Muslim and were not happy about children learning about gender and sexuality. This had an impact on many of the Hadaya members and some of them felt so upset and wanted to be visible 
decided to go onto social media to voice their concerns. What we have here is a short video of some of our Hadaya members talking about what how the protests made them feel. To know that your existence and your sexuality is consistently a debate of topic in media and on TV is really, really disheartening and it makes you feel more invisible. I identify as a gay man and I'm from Birmingham. I'm a queer Pakistani Muslim woman from London. I am a gender non-binary queer Muslim from Glasgow. I am a gay Muslim man and I am from Pakistan now living in London. I identify myself as a lesbian Muslim and I'm from London. There is absolutely nothing in the Quran that says you cannot be gay. You know, and this is something that people don't really realize. It was really heartbroken when I saw a video that the children, they are shouting against us. For young people to be learning about LGBT experiences, I mean, that is quite a big thing, right? Would that have changed any of your lives, do you think, if you'd known about it earlier? I really, really think it would have helped me develop a more compassionate narrative, definitely, with myself. And maybe enable me and equip me to be more open with who I am. I spent many years, you know, um, going through mental health struggles of not really being able to uh, think that I could coexist between being gay and Muslim. So how would something like No Outsiders have changed that then? Well, it would have just made me, you know, realise that there is a possibility of me being myself. Because I knew that I was gay when I was eight years old, actually, and that's in primary school. Should they learn about it? Absolutely. It's everywhere anyway. LGBTQ people like us are everywhere. Kids should be prepared and, and learn about us. But we do actually need to engage the, the parents uh, in, our, in our dialogue. Avoiding teaching children about the law and the, the society in which they're growing up in, it harms them the most because they will, they will not fit in within society. They will be outcasted. I keep to hide myself until like 15 years to come out. I lost everything, even though my parents, my siblings, my whole family, I lost and no one is going to be contact, try to contact me as well. My mom always says the main reason that, you know, she was so devastated when I came out was because she then realized about why it was, why I was the way that I was when I was a teenager, why I was literally depressed all the time. And um, I think a lot of parents will feel really bad if they have gay children, um, that they've basically done that to their own child. We have a unique voice and we need to be heard. They'll be less fearful of it if they can see proud, happy, uh, queer Muslims such as us, you know, living their best lives. So that was a short clip of some of our Hadai members talking about the protests outside the Birmingham Primary School. Um, earlier, earlier on in the presentation, I talked about um, Islamophobia in the online community. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about homophobia in the Muslim community, but online. During lockdown, many of us have had to go online. And when I mention TikTok, the first thing that people might think of is people posting dance routines or doing silly viral challenges. But for many queer Muslims across the world, TikTok became, became a social media platform to raise awareness of being queer and Muslim and tell the world that their identity is valid. Um, however, with the videos came a lot of backlash from the Muslim community. And once again, I'd like to give a trigger warning um, message. Uh, this slide, although it doesn't have as much offensive language in it, for someone like me, I do find some of these messaging triggering as, as these are the messages that I've heard growing up most of my life. I'm just gonna play this short clip. Okay, so I'm with my mom right now. Okay, uh, how do you feel when I came out to you? I came out to her when I was 13. I'm, I'm 18 now. Okay, mama, how did you feel? How did I feel? Yeah, when I came out to you. I love you. I can't live without you. Okay. And I accept you. Thank you. And I kind of sense something when you were a child. Yeah, we all knew. It okay. wasn't a surprise. I love you. I love you too. You are not a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not make mistakes. Science is broad. We are still as humans learning. No one wants to be abnormal and be ostracized by society. So you are a special, beautiful child, a beautiful human being. I love you. What do you have to say to people who are being rude right now in the comments? I think they're ignorant and they need to be educated. Hell yeah. And I think they need to look into more research. So that was a, a lovely video of a mum defending her son, uh, her trans son. So 
Now, a little bit of LGBT History Month. So a question that we get asked quite a lot is, can I be Muslim and trans? So trans people have always been very prominent in Islam for a very long time. The Makhanatan, referred to as trans women, existed even during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and are mentioned in many hadiths in Islamic history until recently they were accepted and treated well. During the time of the Prophet Muhammad, they were given the highest place of honour of being guardians of certain holy places. Today, many countries uh, continue to support the trans communities. On the 14th of August last year, Pakistan and many of its uh, trans Pakistani people celebrated their second ever Pride event. Some people would probably consider Pakistan as a very conservative Muslim country. However, it has over the past few years given equal, uh, equal rights to trans people, such as rights to better employment, marriage equality, and even representation in parliament which is a lot more than some Western countries have done for the trans community here, closer to home. Although I should mention the trans community, along with the LGB, still face discrimination on a daily basis there too. And being gay and lesbian is still not allowed in, Islam, uh, in Pakistan. So this slide I'm going to show now is someone who is going to talk a little bit about their experience of being trans and Muslim and talk a little bit about their own identity. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. Um, this uh, just sort of at my own curiosity, could you talk a little bit about um, like there, there are certain gender practices in every sort of major religion that seem to um, kind of help create community within people of that particular gender. And so I think a lot of times when people think of Muslim women, they also they often think about like wearing the hijab. Could you talk a little about like how that's been for you as a trans woman and like how that experience has been? Um, I think as a woman and especially as a transgender woman, um, our bodies are essentially public property as like sites for consumption, as sites of dis like discussion and discernment. Um, so that for me, and I know a lot of other women feel similarly, it, um, to wear hijab or to observe um, covering the way that I do is a assertion that my body belongs to me mm -hmm. and is not um, not up for debate. It's not up to, for ownership, but anyone, but between myself and Allah. Mm. And so um, it's funny that, that people try to use it as this like symbol of oppression and repression. And, and so many people have felt the need to try to, to save me yeah. from, from, uh, scary Islamic practice. Um, it has been liberatory for me. Mm -hmm. And it is a, um, for me, an assertion of ownership over my own body mm -hmm. and removing it from the public sphere. That's cool. That's a cool way of thinking about it. It's, it's one of those things where like we don't afford that to, you know, Jewish men who wear a kippah or yarmulke, you know, like other sorts of things like that we don't do. But with Muslim women, that's something that people really harp on. So I wanted to ask you about that and, and get your thoughts on it. Um, could you speak? shares. So that was just a video of someone who was talking a little bit about their identity. Um, I'm going to now start talking a little bit about intersectionality. So we all hold multiple social identities simultaneously, such as race, gender, sexuality, and intersectionality examines how multiple oppressed identities interact to create overlapping and compounding systems of disadvantage. So I've got a short video that I'd like to play. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but let's give it a, a go just now. Um, it does have subtitles if people are going to struggle to listen to the content. This word before? Even if you have, you might not know what it means. Let's take a look at it. The first part's easy enough. Intersect. Just see if you can try this again.
Intersectionality. Have you heard this word before? Even if you have, you might not know what it means. OK, I don't know if that's playing um, just now, um, which is fine. Um, I can move on to the next slide. So, the minority experience is anything but easy. While being able to claim various interesting aspects as part of my own identity, the struggles of each tend to wear down even the strongest of us. Being a racial and sexual minority growing up here in the UK has not been easy, and definitely not without its challenges. So minority stress. Chronic and sustained high levels of stress due to stigmatisation of being in a minority group. And LGBT plus people are recognised as a sexual minority and as a result of current and past prejudicial and discriminatory practices. So the minority stress model offers us a lot more insight into communities or groups that have been othered in our society. And when we look at the negative physical and mental health disparities due to discrimination, um, organisations and can make policies to address those disparities. And it can hopefully help bolster the health of oppressed communities. And a 2018 report from Stonewall, um, it exposed alarming levels of poor mental health among LGBT people compared to the general population. Stonewall study also reveals a shockingly high level of hostility and unfair treatment faced by many LGBT people when accessing healthcare services. Half of LGBT people had experienced depression and three in five had suffered from anxiety, far exceeding uh, estimates for the general population. Uh, population. And Stonewall findings show that poor mental health is also higher among LGBT people who are young, black, Asian, or from a minority ethnic group, as well as disabled or from socioeconomically deprived backgrounds. And it's a shocking picture that, must, that should really serve us all a wake up call and healthcare providers across the sector as well. Here are just some um, comments left by some of our Hadaya members when I said to them that I'd be doing a presentation. Um, these comments at the bottom are not of my, my own comments, but of uh, some of our members. Now talking a little bit about our own growth, we began recognising how crucial the work we were doing in London was and established contacts and networks in different cities around the UK. We have come so far from being a Facebook page in London to having a presence in cities like Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, Glasgow, and Leeds um, and more. Uh, we now are able to connect with uh, queer Muslims from across the UK and together with our online events, um, we've been able to create a platform and a voice for queer Muslims. We're even creating transatlantic links with a team in America who are currently working closely with us. It's a long way from that small team that we had set up in London three years ago. So now just talking a little bit about some of our achievements. We had the opportunity to present to Malaysian officials describing what life is like uh, in the UK for queer Muslims which was a first for them as it is illegal to be gay in Malaysia just now. We have presented to the Government Equalities Office around our experiences. We've partnered with various social and public organisations such as the police, NHS and different councils across the UK. Hadaya in 2019 hosted its first ever conference. We had over 200 delegates turn up for that conference, which was the first in its kind. We discussed some topics such as intersectionality and as Islam. We also continue to work and support other LGBT organisations such as Stonewall and Mindow. Um, and it's important that we keep these, uh, this network going. For many of us, due to COVID, we no longer have that physical space, but providing online support via group, uh, Zoom, via Zoom we've been, uh, has been beneficial for all of us. We've reached our wider community. We're not, we're now seeing people from countries such as Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, India, um, North Africa contacting us in terms of support. 
For this, for this community, we have hosted film screenings, invited guest speakers, writers and directors, empowering people of colour to be able to talk and um, raise their voices. We have been on the radio, taken part in documentaries and written articles for magazines and newspapers. On a personal level, we have also taken part in our podcast series, which is now available on Spotify and our website. But most importantly, last year we launched our Walk With Me mentoring programme, focusing on supporting vulnerable queer Muslims. And um, once again, our most notable achievement has been obtaining charity status whilst being entirely volunteer led organisation, whereby everyone who volunteers does so because they feel passionate about the cause so that we can support and provide welfare for LGBTQI plus Muslims. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and um, I will now pass on to Anthony to see if there was any questions people might have. Anthony, you are Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for the content and for your honesty. Um, I know that you're happy to take a few questions. If people could post any questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to deal with them. Um, I did have one question earlier, uh, Osman, just for us to be thinking about what before people post theirs. What would it what 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 how could we be better allies to to this community? So I think the first thing I would like to say is that just by having this type of event is really important. You're giving grassroots organisations like ourselves a voice. For many for so many years we've just not been heard and sort of um, our voice has just been left and in the margins of society. Um, I think it's, I think listening to not just Hadaya but other organisations being openness and the willingness to feel uncomfortable to talk about subjects like power and privilege is important. Um, and, and acknowledge that people have intersections to their identity and the impact of having those intersections can have. Um, so for me personally, um, if you host an event, maybe just be conscious of who's attending the event and making it more accessible for everybody. So lots of people are putting out good wishes for you, Osman, and sad to hear of your journey and that of your peers in your community. People are asking what we can do to help. So I think that the ally thing is good. How can we be going out and having conversations, though, to support and raise this agenda when we're not as confident with you about the subject matter, but <clears throat> want to help. And I, th well, I think social media is such a great platform, you know, um, by actually liking content on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, following people, listening to their lived experiences. Um, it, it not only are you supporting these people, but you're also educating as well um, by um, being open and honest when you're in meetings or events and you hear something that is maybe racist or homophobic or Islamophobic and just calling it out, you know, that, that is it's those sort of small steps. Um, for us, it's uh, really around helping the community um, and just having our voices heard is, uh, is quite powerful for us at the moment. And there's lots going on just now, um, but I would recommend if people want to help is to follow organisations like Hadaya and other grassroots organisations like Black Lives Matter movement. And there's so, so much out there that you can listen to on podcasts and documentaries that you can watch. Thank you. That's really, We've also just been asked, I'm just about to put a question in the chat about how, whether there's a monthly forum with Hadaya or some with the LGBT BTQ people are able to meet chat via MS Teams or video platforms that are kind of open and accessible, particularly at this time? Yes, so what we, we've been, a lot of our, um, since we lost our physical spaces, we've had to resort to going online. So we've been organising monthly online events. Um, as I said at this, uh, during the presentation that we're completely volunteer led. So I'm doing this presentation from work, you know, my day job. So um, the, the, the events that we do um, are open to everybody. It's not just Muslim queer people, it's open to allies as well. Um, and we do topics such as racism within black and brown communities. That was one topic. We've had screenings of films. And this month for LGBT History Month, we have a 
uh, a director from America who's going to screen his film on the 24th of February. So if you follow us on social media, we will be sending out details of that. We've just not confirmed the exact timing. But yeah, so these online events are really important. Like I said, um, we did an event in August, which was for um, Pride, just a Pride event. And I was shocked to see so many people from across the world zoom into that Pride event. There was people that were zooming in from Saudi Arabia where, you know, it's just impossible to even come out. You can't even wave the pride flag in some of the countries. However, we were able to talk to people about their experiences of living in uh, a, a country which does not recognise um, LGBT issues at all. Um, and that was quite powerful for me because I got to see uh, and hear people talk about their experiences. I'm very lucky that I live in the UK where I have the uh, freedom of speech. Um, and yes, so um, we've been doing various monthly events and we'll continue to do that. And we do a lot of collaboration work like we are today, you know, and it's important that we do these events. How would how is the best way for if people want to join you in those events? And I appreciate it needs to be a closed, safe space. But if people want to join as an ally, what would be the best way of them finding that information? If you just go on to our Facebook page or Twitter, um, Instagram, we post details of how to log into the event. It's an event bright and we do usually at the start have a disclaimer to say that you know we don't allow people to use offensive language. You don't need to be visible if you don't feel comfortable being visible and um, people will be removed if they uh, are seen to break any of the uh, rules, i.e. being offensive or not uh, respecting people's views. OK, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Another question we've had from um, a chaplain working in hospital is saying, what is the best way to encourage Muslim colleagues and staff to think again about whether it's possible to be gay and Muslim? So I think even signposting them to our website. Um, on our website, we have uh, a, a link, a page full of resources about, you know, what uh, from scholars, from people who have studied Islam, um, and people that you know have spent most of their life researching and the sad reality is it's also to allow people to say that you know we're not here to change your opinion but just to give you get you to listen to our experience you know um, uh, I, I don't expect people to um, go to pride and wave the Hedaya flag but at the same time acknowledge that we do have challenges in society at the moment um, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, there isn't a day that doesn't go by where there isn't end something in the news around queer Muslims and LGBTQ Muslims. Um, and it's important that, you know, not we're all guilty of living in our own little bubble. Uh, I do that as well. And it's important to sometimes step out that bubble and listen to other people's uh, lived experiences to appreciate some of the struggles they face. We've just, um, Evo's just helpfully posted your uh, link address into the chat, so it's there if people want it. Um, I haven't got any more questions for you just at the moment, but can I direct people to the Survey Monkey evaluation link that's now been posted in the chat? It's really important that we learn from people really which, which seminar's been most helpful, which webinar, from which webinar you've learned the most, and also where people would like additional webinars to bridge some gaps in knowledge moving forward. So if you can take a few minutes to fill that survey in, that would really, really help us. I think we've got a few more minutes if anybody has any more questions for Osman. Okay, I'm not hearing anything else. There's no more questions in the chat that I can see. Okay, I think we have another one. OK, so people are thanking you for the session and how helpful it is. And I'd just like to thank you again for your honesty. I think we've all learned something and I'm so pleased that you were able to join us. 
Thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I think I can say for all of us, you know, these are challenging times. You know, we haven't got um, the normal routines that we're used to uh, in like 2019. And it's been uh, a struggle for everybody, I think. And uh, you will find more and more people going online. And if you are online, just um, be careful of language, the use of language. And also um, um, think about your own mental health as well. I think that's important that if you are struggling to reach out to people, um, I think that's important for, for every person, not just for sort of queer Muslims, but generally there is organisations out there that can help. Great, thank you. Really good way to end the session. Thank you so much everybody for listening in. Thank you Osman again. Thank you Evo for your support with the technical magic behind the scenes and uh, we'll meet again on Friday. Our webinar on Friday is from our staff networks experience, so very much about lived experience and how we can work together to be allies to our staff networks. So thank you all everybody, stay safe and we'll talk to you again on Friday. Thank you.